Good evening and welcome to day two of celebrating National Astronomy Week 2020 Mars Encounter. Thank you for joining us. As you may have noticed in our intro video made by Hersman Zoo, astrophotographer John Fox of Wheeled and Astronomers, the NAW is composed of several astronomy organizations around the UK. And you can find out more about us at astronomyweek.org.uk. Hello, my name is Lucinda Offer, and I am delighted to be the chair of National Astronomy Week Mars Encounter. Tonight, I have the honor of having Nigel Henbest as uh, one of our hosts this evening. Nigel, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thank you for that, Lucinda. Yeah, I'm Nigel Henbest. I'm an astronomer uh, and, and a writer, author of many books, including Mars, the Inside Story of the Red Planet, which was published back in 2003. Um, another famous Mars event when the red planet was closer to us than it had been in 60,000 years. It's not quite as close this time, but it's going to be a magnificent sight in the sky. I was also the chair of National Astronomer Week 1990, which is when we spearheaded the campaign against light pollution in this country. So I'm very pleased to be back on National Astronomy Week on for this broadcast, and I will be hosting the second half of this show. Thank you so much, Nigel. Thank you for being with us. It's fantastic that you have been with, uh, with uh, us before. Okay, so I just wanna remind everyone that, I'm, and, uh, that NEW, the National Astronomy Week is going on until the 22nd of November. And you can register for our other events at Eventbrite and search for NEW 2020 when you go there, or you can go to our website where you can find local online events to celebrate this week. On to this evening, we have the theme is Mars rocks. So all about geology of Mars and just how amazing Mars is. And so much science is being done on Mars with all these rovers on the planet. Tonight, we're gonna talk to two scientists about a couple of those robots that are on Mars. And our first speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Anna Horliston, who is a planetary seismologist based at the University of Bristol, currently working as part of the science team for NASA's InSight mission to Mars. She spends her days looking at seismic data for Mars, finding Mars quakes, and tries to figure out what is going on inside our red planet. Welcome to NAW, Dr. Horliston. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Thank you for that, Lucinda. Hopefully, you can now all see my slides. Somebody shout if that's not the case. Um, so tonight, as Lucinda said, I'd like to talk to you about the InSight mission to Mars. Um, and as part of the Mars rocks, I actually want to take a talk about how Mars literally rocks, um, as in Mars quakes. So we all know what the outside of Mars looks like. I mean, we've seen lots of images already this evening and I'm sure you saw some yesterday and you'll see plenty more over the coming week. But what InSight has gone to Mars to do is to look at the interior. So we have a, a really big kind of mission. We want to start and understand the formation and evolution of terrestrial planets through investigation of the interior structure and processes of Mars. And I'll explain a little bit more how we're gonna do that as we go through this, this talk. Now, we got three key techniques we're going to use for this. We've got seismology, geodesy, and heat flow, and that's how we wangle everything together to come up with our acronym, Interior Exploration, using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport. So that's what INSIGHT is. Now, the most important one of these is seismology, and that's not just because I'm a seismologist. It really is. That is how we look inside planets. If you think about how we look inside human bodies, say you want to know if you've broken your leg, you'll use an X-ray and that uses energy from the X-ray machine, which passes through your body and then is uh, recorded on the photographic paper on the other side. Seismology is basically the same thing. We use the energy from earthquakes on one side of the planet, recorded by seismometers on the other side of the planet. And the signal that we record tells us about what that, that wave has passed through. And that's how we know what's inside planets. So, We've got lots of questions we want to answer. Now you'll see here as a graphic, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, the Moon, and Mars, all pretty much to scale. Um, and these are the terrestrial planets. Now our big question is, did Earth and Mars form from the same stuff? Did all the rocky planets form from the same, same stuff? Now we know what's inside Earth because we've got lots of, you know, we've got over hundred years of seismology. We've obviously got geologists. We can go and look at the actual rocks on Earth. We've looked at the rocks on the moon and we've had seismometers on the moon. So it's a natural step to go and try and find out what Mars is made of and see how different that is. 
So we want to know how big Mars's core is and is it solid or is it liquid or is it some kind of, you know, partially liquid? And how often do Mars quakes happen and how often do meteorites strike Mars? And that's an awful lot of questions. Now, like I said, seismology is our key tool. Now, at the dawn of the age of planetary exploration, when we first started sending robots into space, we sent seismometers with them. So we sent them on the Ranger missions to the moon. The Apollo astronauts deployed seismometers on the moon. And the first landers sent to Mars carried seismometers. So the Viking landers in the 1970s, so 40 years ago, they took seismometers as well. So we knew it was really important. And that's why InSight was designed with its primary instrument as the seismometer. So there's a lot of things about InSight and there are a lot of acronyms to learn. I'm just gonna run quickly around this slide. I'm gonna go from top left and I'll circulate around clockwise to bottom, uh, bottom left, just to run through the other instruments so you've got an idea of the bigger mission. So the first thing we have is IDS, the Instrument Deployment System. This is basically a robotic arm. Um, it's, a, it's the instrument deployment arm, and then there's a grapple on the end, and there's a scoop, and there's an instrument deployment camera. There's a secondary camera below the deck that looks out in front of you, and you'll see some great images from that and the instrument deployment camera later in the talk. Um, and that lets us see the workspace in front of the lander. We've got twins. These are these two white booms you can see in this picture. They measure the temperature and the wind. These are really important because the, the wind across Mars shakes the lander and then we record that by our seismometer. But we don't want to know about the wind. It's an interesting thing and there are lots of other people who love learning about the wind, but we want to know about what's coming from the inside of the planet. So we need to know what the wind is doing so that we can know what the ground is doing. We've got RISE, the Rotation and Interior Structure Experiment. That's going to find out whether the planet wobbles or not. And if it wobbles in its orbit, then it's got a liquid core. So it's a really important experiment for us. And then we've got size, the seismic experiment for the interior structure that's taken the pulse of Mars. And in fact, what you see here is this silver dome. That's actually the wind and thermal shield, which is protecting size from all that wind. The instrument itself, I'll show you in a moment. We've got the auxiliary payload sensor suite, which is a whole name for a whole bunch of other little instruments we sent up, including a pressure sensor, which measures the pressure signal as dust devils go past. And then we've got HP cubed, which is the heat flow and physical properties probe, also known as the mole. So anyone who's been following the mission will know this as the mole. Um, and it's trying to hammer its way down so that it can take the temperature so that we can find out how much heat is still coming out of Mars, because that tells us how warm the planet is, how quickly it cooled and what the interior is likely to be like. So that's the schematic. This is what the real spacecraft looks like. Here it is on the assembly floor, and you can see three of the Lockheed Martin engineers working on it. You can see the huge solar panels that concertina are out. They actually fold in like a fan for flight. But then once landed, they, they expanded out. Um, the white dome you can see is the um, wind and thermal shield and the copper box. I'm just wondering if I can get my mouse to point in the right place to show you here. This, if you can see my mouse, this is the seismometer. Um, so that's, that's my favorite instrument. Um, so that's on the assembly floor. The next time we saw this, uh, the lander looking uh, complete with its solar panels out was on Mars. And this was, we landed on Mars in November 2018, so just over two years ago. We've been there for just over one Martian year now, or two Earth years. And when we first arrived, we got that instrument deployment camera up on the arm to take a whole bunch of photos. Obviously, it couldn't take a photo of the whole thing because we couldn't get the arm far enough away, but they've taken this mosaic put it together and this was InSight's first selfie. So again, you can see the seismometer there front and center, but there's a problem with this picture for me because to record Mars quakes, we need that seismometer on the ground. But right now it's on the deck of the lander um, and you can see lots of beautiful rocks behind it for those who are interested in the actual rocks, lots of rocks, lots of red sand, um, but there's our seismometer, that big copper box right in front of us still on the lander. So all it, all it records there is pretty much what we recorded with the Viking sensors, but I'm going to let you hear it because it's quite cool as well. What you record when you're on the deck is the wind shaking the lander. So just going to hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Um, this is the sound of the wind on Mars. And it sounds a little bit like the wind on Earth, really, but that's actually the wind on Mars. So I hope you can hear that. If not, I'm hoping someone will shout at me. Um, and that's so basically what we've done there is we've listened, the seismometer has been recording the vibrations and then we've sped it up. Um, so we've raised it up two octaves 
um, so that you can actually hear it because actually it would be too, too low for us to hear. Um, now, it took us, uh, normally when I deploy a seismometer, it takes me about an hour. It took us 73 days to deploy the seismometer on Mars. We first of all had to take lots of photos and then you'll see here, if you work around again from the top left, you'll see us grappling the uh, seismometer and picking it up. So for anyone wondering, the grapple is very much like um, a, a claw hand from uh, an arcade game. And in fact, that's what they designed it on, but one that is designed to actually hold onto things, not drop them the moment it's picked them up. So we had to grapple onto that little nubbin on the top of the seismometer, pick it up and then put it down on the surface. And then, as I said, to protect it from the wind and the daily temperature changes, the temperature on the surface of Mars changes by nearly 100 degrees every day. So that's not much good for a really, really sensitive instrument. So we put the wind and thermal shield, this white dome over the top, and this has been described as a very expensive tea, tea cozy. Um, it's slightly more, yeah, it, it is, there's an awful lot of engineering that went into this, uh, the wind and thermal shield, but it does do a great job of keeping size at a relatively um, stable temperature. So there we go. Seismometer was on the ground. This is what it looks like when you look at it from the context camera on the ground. And for anyone wondering, there is a rock in this picture. Um, I'm going to highlight with my mouse if I can. This rock here, this rock has a name. This rock is the Ace of Spades rock. Because if you look to the right of that rock, there's one of our lander feet. Now, for us to have a successful mission, we needed to land with all three feet safely on the ground. And we needed to land somewhere with less than 15 degrees tilt. When Prior to landing, we'd counted all the rocks, or well, a PhD student in, in California anyway, had counted all the rocks in the, in the proposed landing site and said that there was a one in 52 chance of hitting a rock on landing. And that morning of the, of the landing, the PI of the, one of the seismic instruments, Tom, said to one of his students, he said, um, right, so it's a one in 52 chance. That's like you picking the ace of spades from this deck of cards at which point Konstantinos did pick the Ace of Spades from that deck of cards. So when we landed with one of our feet, not more than two feet away from this rock, this rock then became known as the Ace of Spades rock. So there you go, there's a little bit of geology for you. Ace of Spades rock, right under insight on, on the Elysium Planitia. So anyway, back to the seismometer. We've got the seismometer on the ground. Now we can listen to the ground. And this is the kind of thing I look at every day. So my job is to work for the Mars Quake Service and I literally spend my days looking at seismic data from Mars. It comes down with about a 10 hour delay. So like now I can look at data from first thing this morning, um, which is great. My job is to find Mars quakes in that data. So this picture here might just look like this uh, nice colored thing to you. So I'll give you a quick description of it so that you know what we're looking at. At the top, we've got the actual amplitude of the ground motion. So those wiggly lines show how the ground is moving up and down as you go through the day. This plot is for one Martian day, which we call a Sol, um, and we wrap around a little bit at either end. So you see at the bottom of the screen, there's a scale that says Sol 184, and it runs all the way through, and then it starts Sol 185, mid, uh, yeah, midnight, Sol 185 at the end. You've also got UTC time, so that's Earth time. Um, so this was for um, June 3rd last year. Um, and you can see that obviously Earth time and Mars time aren't the same, um, but um, a Mars day is uh, 20 four hours and 39 minutes long. So uh, they're not far off, but they just get slightly out of sync as you go. Now the main body of the plot, this beautiful colorful thing, this shows you the amplitude of the signal at different frequencies. So you can see the scale up the left hand side. So we have higher frequencies at the top and lower frequencies at the bottom. And the yellow means it's a really strong signal and the blue means it's a really quiet signal. So what you'll see is that there's this really noisy bit in the middle of the day. And basically that's when the planet warms up and we get strong winds and we see lots of noise. And then in the evening, just after sunset, it gets calmer and quieter and we have a, a much better chance of finding Mars quakes. You'll also see these horizontal lines that go across the plot. If I just find my mouse, so here and here, these are known resonances of the lander. So just like any structure, the lander will vibrate at certain frequencies. And we know those are lander modes also because you see certainly the one at about six hertz, um, it dips in the middle. So as it gets warmer, the frequency is modulated. So those are our resonances of the, of the lander. So that's what a typical day looks like. This day does not have any Mars quakes though. So it's not a very interesting day from my point of view. This day, this does have a Mars quake hidden in it. This is one of the first Mars quakes we spotted and it's actually quite well hidden. It's in this white box here. 
Um, and I'm going to play you now a recording of this signal from this. Again, we have to amp, we have to, what's the word? Increase the frequency by a couple of octaves so that you can actually hear it because you can't hear a signal at 10 hertz, but you can hear one at you know 200 hertz. So I'm going to play this video and you're going to hear the sound of the wind, which will sound a little bit like the wind we heard earlier. Then you'll start hear the sound of a Mars quake. And then you'll hear the sound of the vibrations that the robotic arm makes when it moves. And they're quite uh, one of the coolest sounds you'll hear, actually, probably more cool than the mask quake. But I'll, I'll let you listen and I'll try not to talk too much. That's wind. see there is that the seismic waves, the, the actual, the, the, the frequency content of them is very different between the wind and the um, Mars quake and the movement of the robotic arm. It sounds different and it looks different. They're very distinct things, which is great from my point of view because it means we can find them. So that's what we like to call a high frequency Mars quake. Some of our best quakes on Mars are actually low frequency ones. So this one here, you'll see here, it comes in the lower half of this plot when we look at these daily spectrograms. And that is, this was a magnitude 3.7 quake and it occurred on Sol 173. So that's 173 Martian days into what, since we landed on Mars. For anyone on earth, that was um, May 23rd, 2019. Now this is a really great quake and we had another one not very long after it on Sol 185 and both of these we were able to work out exactly where they came from and by looking at, I say oh, I've got the wrong date, 235, <laughs> the second one arrived, but what you'll see here we have a map of Mars, the yellow triangle here is um, InSight and these two, we've zoomed in here, these two ellipses show the probable location of these two quakes, so that's the most likely place. Um, and there was a third quake as well over here. What you can also see on this map, these red lines are fault lines um, on the surface of Mars. These are faults that we can see from space, from the photo photography we've got. And those two quakes, Sol 173, the one I just showed you in the spectrogram, and 235, they both lie within the bounds of Cerberus Fossi. Now, from beautiful imagery we've got, this is NASA imagery, so we've got some great photos as well. Cerberus Fossi is an area of Mars where there are these huge long trenches. They, I mean, like thousands of kilometers long and only, you know, meters to kilometers wide. Massive uh, features on the surface. Not, you know, not as massive as uh, Valles Marineris, but still massive long features. And we knew before we went to Mars that we might see seismic signals from here because we've seen boulders, photos of boulders that have clearly fallen down the cliffs within the fossil. And these are boulders that are far too big to be blown by the wind because things don't, rocks don't get blown by the wind. Even if you've seen the Martian and you say, well, people get blown over by the wind on Mars. No, they don't. Rocks do not get blown over by the wind on Mars. But they, so they moved. We know they moved because we've got photos before and after and we've got trails from them falling and we know we get avalanches as well. But these boulders weren't falling in avalanches, they were falling from what we think were, were Mars quakes. And we've seen two Mars quakes coming from exactly this region. So. It's all kind of coming together, to my mind, Mars rocks, and it's really quite exciting. Now, what's more exciting, or, or I don't know, more exciting, also exciting, the waveform of this. So, and you actually look at the, the wiggly line, the actual how the ground is moving. This is what it looks like. Now, for anyone who's not a seismologist, one of the things we do all the time as seismologists is we go, you have different types of seismic waves that travel through the Earth. So you have a P wave, which is a compressional wave, and the wave, the, so the particles move in the same direction as the wave front. And you have a shear wave, the S wave, which where the particles move side to side. Now, the one where the particles move in, in the same direction as the wave travels faster than the ones where they move side to side. So the P wave will arrive before the S wave. Time difference between the two tells you how far away the quake is. Um, and we see this on Earth and we see it on Mars. What we don't see is we don't see it on the moon. So if we look at this plot, 
we've got the very top. This was made by my colleagues in Zurich. So they use Swiss quakes and quakes near to them. So there's a Swiss quake at the top. So it's a very small, um, tiny little quake, you know, less than a magnitude one probably. And it lasts about 30 seconds. And it's just this small impulsive thing. And they get a lot of those in Switzerland. Then we've got a quake, which is two and a half thousand kilometers away. And you can see it has these kind of, it has a the little blip, but green arrival uh, comes around, right, it's kind of obscured by the big blue one, but there's a P wave here and an S wave here. Um, and we get some surface waves. Now the Mars quake, we see our P wave and our S wave, and they look a bit different because these signals are really scattered. Um, and I'll tell you, so it tells us a lot about the crust of Mars because on earth, the crust is kind of wet, and so signals can travel straight through the crust. They travel quite neatly, uh, as if it was coming through, you know, like a, a nice unbroken piece of glass. But on Mars, it's like you've got a block of slight, a fractured glass. You know, when you get glass and it gets all crazy and you can see all the cracks in it. That's what Mars is a bit like. There's all these cracks and the waves just bounce all about. They hit, hit, a, hit a, um, a boundary or crack and they bounce off in a different direction. Not quite as much, though, as we see on the moon. So the red trace on this plot is a moon quake. And you'll see this is just one long, big dispersive signal. It just keeps ringing for over an hour and it just there's no really clear arrival. You can't see a clear, clear P or a clear S phase, which we can see on Mars. So these are really quite cool and they tell us quite a lot about the actual crust. It tells us that it's slightly wetter than the moon, but not as wet as Earth and that it is very broken up. Now, one thing we wanted to do, I said we wanted to tell how many um, how many meteorite impacts there were, uh, because, you know, on on Mars, you do get meteorites that just really hammer into the surface of the planet. Um, and not like on Earth, where, where obviously they get they can burn up in the atmosphere and only occasionally do really big ones actually hit the surface or or tiny fragments of ones that have exploded in the atmosphere. On Mars, you get quite a lot of um, impacts that genuinely hit the surface. We've, we've got the um, high-rise cameras orbiting, taking photos for us. So we'd really hope that we would see a photo of a new impact crater, and then we'd be able to see the seismic signal. And last year, back in, January, in February last year, well, April, we finally got this image. And you can see um, here in pl plots B and C, um, this is a photo from February 21st, this is April the 6th, and there's this black dust cloud here. And if you zoom in, you can see this crater here. This crater formed only 37 kilometers away from InSight. But we had six weeks of seismic data to try and figure out which of those little signals might be this impact. And unfortunately, we can't, couldn't tell. We had a number of quakes that could have been it, but we don't know which one because we don't have you know, a precise date and none of them looked completely like it might be an impact. Now, that's not to say we've not stopped looking for them. We are, we are still looking for impacts. We hope to see a really big one because it will be like a calibration shot. If we know exactly where it was, then that will really help us improve our models of the structure of, of the planet. But as yet, we haven't managed to see one. So what have we found out? So the biggest and clearest events that we've seen can be located to, located to Cerberus Fossi. And this is like a really cool geological feature and it's about 1600 kilometers from InSight. And the quakes from there are likely caused by release of stress from this system of faults, because most of those faults when they formed had a lot of stress in the system. Now, all the quakes are very scattered signals, which tells us that Mars's crust is broken up and not as wet as Earth's crust, but not as dry as the moon. And Mars really does rock, you know, there really are Mars quakes, but nowhere near as violently as Earth because we don't have plate tectonics. Now, the big problem for us on Mars is that those rocks on Mars also turn into dust and that dust gets swept up by dust storms and then it settles down out of the atmosphere and it lands on everything. And it doesn't care that it's landing on our solar panels or on our instruments. Um, but it really matters to us because if you look at these three images taken shortly after we landed December 7th, 2018, July 18th, 2019, July 12th, 2020, and dust and dust and dust, and more dust is settling on our solar panels. And if it keeps settling, we won't have a mission <laughs> for more than another couple of years because we just won't have the power, which is really sad. But we hope, hope we might see a dust devil blow through and blow it off but we'll just have to wait and see. So that's that's my my knowledge of the rocks on Mars is that they sprinkle dust all over my solar panels and I don't like it. Um, as, much, as beautiful it is as, as it is to see images of dust on Mars, I just don't want it on my solar panels. And I'm gonna end with one final rock. This is possibly the most famous rock from our mission. This is the Rolling Stones rock. 
So when we landed, we came down with retro thrusters. I said the wind doesn't blow things on Mars. It, it, it does blow a little bit. It doesn't blow big, big rocks. Our retro thrusters managed to blow this little rock here. Um, let me find my mouse, this rock here. You see it started off here and it did this little wiggly trail here. And so we, we nicknamed it the Rolling Stones Rock and then NASA decided that they would actually name it the Rolling Stones Rock and they presented an image of this rock to the Rolling Stones at a gig they were doing in, in California. So this is the Rolling Stones Rock. And on that note, I'm gonna leave it and um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Hopefully I can answer some of them. If not, feel free to ping me um, or, or check out the website that's listed here. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollison. No <laughs> it's amazing how much data we're getting back and how some of these, uh, you know, these instruments are actually working together with orbiters and rovers or landers, which is the case with InSight. It's actually a lander, it doesn't move around. But uh, we do have some questions in the queue, so that's uh, excellent. And um, we, if you want to leave a question for Dr. Harleston, you have a moment uh, more to put a question in the Q&A box, or if you're on YouTube, uh, to present a question for her there. But uh, some of the questions here are kind of about vibrations, you know, understanding that what, what the size molecule is picking up our vibrations. Uh, Terry Mosley asks, um, you know, with the temperature difference on Mars, he's expecting that the instrument expands and contrasts. So does the seismometer pick up any of those sort of vibrations? Yes, it does. In fact, um, you know, we do have, we have, we have nicknames for a lot of them. We have dinks and donks um, and, um, and we have glitches. So what we do see, yeah, we see some very characteristic signals um, from the instrument, the instrument itself warming up, from the lander warming up, um, just like, like say, if, if you, when you turn the heating on and your boiler starts making cracky noises, or when you turn off your engine in the car uh, on a cold day and then it ticks away to itself. Um, yeah, exactly that. We see those. They're really distinct from the uh, quake signals. Um, but yeah, we do, yeah, very much see that. So. Yeah, there's quite a cool video actually. If you go on the website, there is a sound file of them. I didn't have time to play it to you today, but it sounds like they they what they say is a deranged um, round by the clock because they, they get faster and faster as the temperature changes faster. So yeah, go check it out. There's some great sounds. Great. great. It's, it's amazing how sensitive the instrument is and all the different things it can pick up. But it didn't. We couldn't pick up that one meteor impact. <laughs> <laughs> so disappointing. It was like a tiny pebble, though. Apparently. <laughs> Celebrate the wins. Okay, uh, another one that says, uh, you know, in, in um, determining Earth epicenter of earthquakes, uh, scientists use triangulation, but in the case of Mars quakes, how do you find the location of an epicenter and are there any love uh, and Rayleigh waves involved in these Mars quakes? That's uh, a couple of great questions there. So yeah, we had to spend a long time before landing uh, looking at new ways of working with single, single station techniques. So our primary methodology is obviously we, get the, we can get the distance from the PNS phases. And then we, for these ones, we looked at the particle motion, which um, so we can track the way the literally the particles are, are moving directly under the sensor to see what direction the waves came from. So with distance and direction, it's not as great as triangulation would be. Yeah, we would love to have more seismometers. If anyone wants to throw some money at more seismometers on Mars, please, please, yeah, give me a call. Um, but uh, yeah, so they, it, it, we have had to develop new techniques, but basically we're relying on polarization and the uh, PNS travel wave travel times, which obviously we've had to create our own velocity models, but they seem to be working quite well. Um, and uh, I forgot where I was going. That's why we've only got good locations for three quakes, because those are the only three we've managed to get polarization for because of the way the waves are scattered by, by the time they get to us. So once they've scattered and then they're coming off from all directions rather than just the direction of the quake. I want to get in a couple, just two quick more questions, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the, what's the average magnitude of these uh, Mars quakes and what's the strongest Mars uh, magnitude that uh, InSight's been able to record? The strongest quake we've had is, I think it's a 3.9 on the Mars magnitude scale. So that's a kind of equivalent to the Richter scale. Um, most of them are more like a two, so between two and three, really. So you wouldn't even feel them on Earth. Um, but our seismometer is literally so sensitive, it can move, manage, um, manage, it can record the vibration, uh, a vibration, the width of a hydrogen atom, which is like so small, I can't even imagine that. But that, that's the kind of level of vibration we can pick up. And do you think there's anything, uh, most interesting thing that's been found on Mars so far? Most interesting, by insight or by anybody? 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, my, my insight, it was fascinating to see real quakes and to find that they were from service for side side. That's a really exciting link. Um, oh my goodness, there's so many amazing results from, from the Mars missions. I mean, I love looking at the, even just those like those rounded pebbles that um, Curiosity see, and it's just like, oh, look at those. Like, how did, you know, I know there was water on Mars, but still, it's like just seeing all the different geology. And I was actually looking the other day at some photos of avalanches. So, literally, there was a photo of an avalanche happening, a, a, a ground or a rock fall, I suppose, actually, because it was rocks. Um, and it's just like to have caught that live. Um, by one of the, the orbiting um, cameras was just awesome. So, yeah. That, and again, it's like, it's incredible, the data and the things that we're catching with some of the orbiters and the images that we get back. Um, so thank you so much and a very insightful um, a talk you gave us on insight and on Mars quakes and seismology. It's just amazing that actually uh, as a geologist myself, and wanting to study geology for Mars, I never thought we would be finding out about, you know, Earth, Mars quakes or quakes on another planet. It's just incredible. Yeah. So I hope you hang out with us because actually I've heard we might have some pictures during our remote observations of an actual current dust storm on Mars. I know it's not something we want to hear about, especially with their, it, how it's stopping our instruments from recharging its batteries. But uh, uh, we hope you hang out with us a little, lo a little longer, Dr. Hodgson. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to move on to uh, Nigel Henbest, who's going to um, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Nigel. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for giving us uh, that insight, if I can use the word, uh, into the, the, what goes on inside the red planet. Um, we're going to move on now to look at the surface, maybe more conventional geology. Well, it's not conventional because it's on a very different planet from ours. And I'm delighted to welcome Suzanne Schrenzer, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Earth, Environment and Ecos Ecosystem Sciences at the Open University. And she studied mineralogy in Germany and then spent two years at Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. She's worked on impact generated hydrothermal systems, a lot of things actually, so just some I picked out, Martian meteorites and the interactions between rocks and the noble gases, methane and water. She's now a member of the NASA team that runs the Curiosity rover. So welcome to National Astronomy Week. Thank you for the very nice introduction. And yes, that's a long list of things that I have actually worked on. But uh, today I am going to speak about some of these things, not all of them, uh, as I only have 20 minutes. And uh, so let's get started. If, if you are interested in curiosity, I will say that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I am going to talk about the general geology, about the rocks themselves. And if you are interested in curiosity, please tune in next Thursday when Dr. Uh, Professor Sanjeev Gupta will be speaking. And with this, let's get on. Here is a picture of Mars, and this is a map of Mars. Uh, Anna uh, mentioned the orbiters and I mentioned impact craters, so, so she has set me up very, very well. She also mentioned the big fracture systems. So let you get orientated on this map. On the upper right, you see the height in kilometers. There is the white, which is very high. There is zero, which would be sea level on Earth, but there is no water on the surface of Mars at this moment in time. So we have an arbitrary datum, which is zero. And then we have things that go lower. As I said, on Earth, this would be filled with water. Right now here, this is um, below that arbitrary datum. And now if you look at the um, this map, you see that in the north it is blue, it is low, but you also see that the surface is smooth and we see only very few of these impact craters. Here is one, there is one. These surfaces that are smooth, they are young. If you look to the south where it is red, it is a lot higher, but then we have lots of these craters. So we have the highlands, they are old and they have accumulated many, many craters. I should probably also say that Hellas and Argyre are very, very large basins. So they are large holes in the ground made from meteorite impacts. And then there is a third area and that is actually over here on the left. 
you see it is very high. It, in, it has the highest places such as Olympus Mons and the Tharsis volcanoes. And this is the volcanic region of Mars and the area is very smooth. So these are the three regions that I want you to just memorize for the rest of this talk. And now we are going to a timeline of Mars. If you look at this column for the moment, you see 4.1, that's billion years, 3.7 billion years, and 3.0 billion years. These are the three dates to memorize for Mars. Why? Well, because from 4.1 to 3.7, it's the Noachian. And if you have, if you look to the right of this, you see a lot was happening. Let's not get into the details at this very point. A lot was happening in the Noachian. And then just if you look from a distance at this slide, it got a bit more quiet on Mars, things slowed down. And so you see the Hesperian from 3.7 to 3.0, and you have different processes happening, but it get generally got a bit quieter than in the Noachian. And then you have the Amazonian where very few things are still happening, but some things such as glaciers start to form. Now, what's happening here? Well, there is a big climate change on Mars. In the Norchian, Mars was warm and wet, or maybe cold and wet, but it was warm enough to have flowing water. Anna just mentioned the little pebbles on Mars. So that is really what was happening in the Norchian. We had water that flowed on the surface of Mars. And if you want to know all about this, Thursday, Sanjeev's talk. Then at about 3.7 billion years, there was the climate change. It got cold and it got dry. And so it didn't get dry in one thing, but it, we have outflow channels, we have more episodic water. And finally, from 3 billion years into the Amazonian, Mars was completely dry, except for ice, because it now was cold. If you're familiar with the Earth timeline, we have the four most, uh, four biggest eons here, the Hadean, approximately parallel to the Noachian, the Archean, approximately parallel to the Hesperian, and then the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic parallel to the Amazonian, just for those of you who have studied Earth geology. I today want to focus on two processes, impact craters and volcanism. Let's start with the impact craters. So the impact craters, they were most frequent in the Noachian. And that's also why the old surfaces have loads of them, younger processes. And if only the dust that Anna showed uh, in her um, uh, talk, uh, erase older features. So the impact craters are from the Noachian and then they got fewer and fewer than in the Hesperian and other processes that happened in the Hesperian might just have erased the evidence where you don't see them today. So let's look at how an impact crater forms. I am showing a complex crater. So imagine a rock of a kilometer or more diameter hurtling towards Mars. So it comes in here, it hurtles towards Mars and it hits the surface of Mars at huge speed. And now it, it drills down into the surface. What happens here is not what you, uh, what you might know if you accidentally hit the car and you put a dent in it. What happens here is more like an underground explosion because that rock will travel, 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 travel until all its kinetic energy is turned into heat and that heat melts the rocks around. We have a shock wave. That's what Anna actually detects that goes out. And so if a very big one would happen, she would detect that shock wave. But also the meteorite is at some point stops and every bit of kinetic energy has turned into heat, which means it, the rocks melt, there is a lot of vapor that forms, and that then causes an explosion. And that explosion throws out molten rock here and other rocks as well, and it causes materials to flow downwards. Now, a few milliseconds after this has happened, everything goes quiet from that place. Still, the rock is flying outwards and settling and the ground that has been very compressed comes back up. So now we have a quiet surface. We have over steepened uh, rims of the crater. So just imagine you tip a bucket of sand. It will be a very steep hill that then gradually flows to the outside because 
you, it reaches the angle of repose. That's happening in the modification stage. And a few minutes after everything is over, what you have here is the marginal zone, which has settled to the gravity and is now stable. You have the ejecta layer of hot rock that covers everything. You have a pool of molten rock in the crater mode, and you have that central uplift that is from the relaxation of the rock. So this is what you will observe on the surface. And here is one. This one is about five or six kilometers in diameter. Here on the upper left is a scale bar. You see the rim perfectly fresh and uh, preserved. You see some of the slumping and sliding and the terraces here. And you see a little bit of a central uplift in the middle. Five kilometers is when it is starting with central uplifts on Mars. But I have chosen this crater for another reason. What you see around here is this, what we call the lobate ejecta blanket. So the ejecta, they didn't just land in a, a circular uh, pattern around or in a radial pattern around, but they have these flow-like textures. And that's when impacts actually hit a surface that has water in it. That is very typical. So this is a sign of water in the deep subsurface of Mars. A very small impact crater, that's about uh, 100 feet or 30 meters in diameter, and it's one of the very new ones. So um, November 2013, not quite as new as Anna's, but still, it's a tiny, tiny 30 meter diameter thing. And we have these rays where the, the, the shock waves and the pressure air wave has disturbed the surface and uh, just blown away the dust a little bit, not the big rocks probably. And so this is how a very fresh and tiny impact crater looks. Now, coming back to this image, I said it all happened in the Noachen. So we now know that this southern part, the southern highlands are very old. They formed in the Noachen. And in the Noachen, when all the water processes happened and when everything else on Mars was most active. And that also counts for the volcanoes on the left over here. So let's look at the volcanoes. The Tharsis bulge, that will have happened very early on. And then volcanism continued, and you see volcanism continues maybe to this day. We don't exactly know, but I will certainly make an argument that we know that volcanism happened as shortly as 160 million years ago. I spoke about billions. Remember, uh, these are three billions. So 160 millions, that's somewhere up there, right? So with that, let's look at how volcanoes happen on Earth. This picture might actually be familiar to you. And you might know that the mid-ocean ridges are a place where the mantle comes closer and it actually magma oozes out to the right and left and it pushes what's called the oceanic plate to the right and left away from this mid-ocean ridge. And now I have mentioned plates. The Earth is a wet planet, as Anna showed it in her uh, talk and her seismic reaction of a planetary crust to um, a fracture or an impact. Here we see that with the water in the crust, we can form plates and these plates can move. And when I say here at the mid-ocean ridge, they move outwards, that also means because the earth isn't expanding, they need to go down and be recycled somewhere and that's at the continental margins. And you see volcanoes here as well. But these are not the types of volcanoes that we think happened on Mars because there is no plate tectonic on Mars. What we think happens here is a third type of volcanism, which is here. What we think is we have a mantle that comes up and brings hotter material up, melting a magma here into a magma here. And that magma then climbs upwards because it is less dense than the crust and comes up and forms these shield volcanoes. One on Earth is the volcanic chain of Hawaii. And Hawaii is a chain because that plate constantly moves above this spot. On Mars, that's not happening. We don't have plate tectonics, so everything is stable and still. And that means that we have the biggest volcanoes all here, and they have grown in the same spot all the time. We have a hotspot underneath, and they have grown. We don't know if they still grow today because we have no observations, but we know that they have grown in that one place over all that time. And here is a close-up of them. 
you see this is Olympus Mons, and you see these are the Tharsis volcanoes. Very, very few craters showing you that this indeed is a very young surface. They were active fairly recently. And on the right, just because it's so nice, a close up in real colors of Olympus Mons. And there are two impact craters, and there is its big crater vent, which is in comes in different sub vents. So that's the volcanoes on Mars, but we know more about this. And here are actual rocks from Mars. They are Martian meteorites. And you might have heard the term SNC meteorite, four meteorites on Mars. And this comes from the type specimen, Shergati, Nakla, and Shasingni. And I only want to say something about Shasingni right now, because Shasingni fell in 1815 in Chassigny in France. And it happened to fall at a moment where a scientific convention left the building. And at that time, people weren't so sure if rocks really can fall from space. That was a big debate or fall from the sky as they would have put it back then. And so they saw this meteor fly across the sky, land, they found the rock. And that was proof that rocks indeed fall from the sky. Chassigny is also a piece of the Martian interior. It's made of the uh, mineral olivine, which will be important on the actual almost last slide of my talk. So remember that Chassigny is a piece of the Martian interior made from olivine. Now, why do we know in the first place that these come from Mars? Well, that's not so easy. First of all, there are a couple lines of evidence. They are magmatic rocks. We can look at them. We can look at them in great detail. We can look at them in thin section and classify them as magmatic rocks. And we can age date them and we find they are young. And so if we think about all the bodies around us, if you have an asteroid, that's a very small body that hasn't sometimes even made it to magmatic rocks. And if it has, they are all very old. Then let's look at our moon. It definitely has magmatic rocks, but they are also all very old. And because the moon is smaller than Earth and because it's so small, it cooled very fast. And once the, uh, the body is cool, you can't make magmatic rocks anymore. So we need something that's bigger. So that's Mars or Venus, one of the two. Now think about where they are in the solar system. You are all astronomers or at least interested in astronomy. So I actually don't need to tell you Venus is further in towards the sun than Earth. Mars is further out. Now, if you hit a piece of rock off Mars and off Venus, both will go into an orbit around the sun and start circling towards the largest gravity well that we have, which is the sun. If that's a rock from Venus, it will cross Mercury's path and fall into the sun. If that's a rock from Mars, it will cross Earth's path before it crosses Venus path, Mercury path, and falls into the sun. And if it happens to cross Earth's orbit while the Earth is there, it might actually hit. So the likelihood is much higher that we get a Martian rock and uh, from these planets than from Venus. They also haven't spent much time in space, so they can't come from outside our solar system or from where Pluto is or something, because uh, the irradiation age is fairly young. And then the most important part comes from spacecraft, because there are chemical and isotopical indications. So let me show you the spacecrafts that are actually important for this. Here you see the Viking spacecraft. Viking landed in 1976. And they measured the Martian atmosphere. And they measured the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. What we are concerned with is neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And if I point at this diagram on the upper left, uh, then this diagram will show you that we have uh, the Mars atmosphere as measured by Viking here. The unit is log particles per cubic centimeters. But for what I, am, what I want to tell you, the unit doesn't matter as long as it's the same on both axes, which it is. So the Mars atmosphere as measured by Viking is plotted from here. So krypton at something like nine log particles per cubic centimeters. And now Bogart and Johnson, two colleagues, um, measured a, mar a meteorite that was thought to be one of the Martian meteorites. When you see these four letters here, that's always a meteorite from Antarctica. The 7-9 tells you it was found in 1979 
in Antarctica. And so this meteorite has some glass in it. That's what this lithology sea tells you. And glasses, when these impacts happen, trap the atmosphere that's there at this moment, just as it is. So measuring that glass, they were able to measure the atmosphere of the body that where the meteorite came from. And so that's plotted here. And now you see that the krypton is at almost the exact same place than measured by Viking. And so it goes for argon, neon, krypton, xenon, nitrogen, and even carbon dioxide. So all of these things have been found in the Shurgatite glass in the same relative abundancies than they have been measured by Viking. And that's a good fingerprint, but it gets even better. And now you need to remember that every element or, or most of the elements have isotopes. That's atoms of different weight. There is a different number of neutrons in them. And now if you look at this diagram, I brought three of these isotopes to, to you. One is the uh, one isotope of krypton. Krypton has six of them and two isotopes of xenon. Xenon has nine of them, but we only need two for this. So here I plot a krypton isotope over a one uh, over a xenon isotope, which is the 132. And that's an elemental ratio. And on this axis, I choose two xenon isotopes to plot, and that's an isotopic ratio. And for those of you who are familiar with chemistry a little bit, that's called the three isotopes plot. So now let's look at terrestrial air. Terrestrial air sits here in this diagram. And if I were to measure it, the measurement with its error bars would be about the size of my pointer. So fitting well into that dot and any other measurement would as well. Just to give you a, an indication how far away the Martian interior is from the terrestrial atmosphere in terms of its elemental krypton to xenon ratio. So we are over here. That's, you cannot mix those two up. If you see the numbers, you are sure where you are. And now we have the Martian atmosphere up here. And that is what was measured in this Shergatite glass and by Viking. So you see that if an average measurement is a maximum error of my pointer size, how many pointer sizes can I fit in here? There is no error that I could make if I measure something here. It's the Martian atmosphere. So this is like a fingerprint. If I see this, I know this rock is from Mars. I hope I have convinced you as uh, this because I'm now moving on to water on Mars. So there are two options for water on Mars. One is actually that I have uh, on the left, the dry planet that we see today, and on the right, a much warmer and uh, wetter planet. And what is important, we have evidence for water on Mars, go to Sanjeev's talk. Now, what does this water do when a vol volcano puts its magma there and it's getting very hot. Well, it forms geysers, hot springs. On the left, you have the black smokers at the mid-ocean ridges. On the right, you have Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. But I specifically brought the two pictures in the middle because up here, that's from a town where I lived in, in Wiesbaden, Germany. You have a hot spring. You see the steam here. It's a just under 100 degree coming out here and it deposits a lot of this red rust iron and here you see some algae taking advantage of it living in probably what 70 degree hot water down here this is mammoth hot springs in uh, also yellowstone national park and here the hot springs bring up a lot of silica and i'm showing you this because this is a very com complex picture to show you that these hot water systems move around a lot of elements. So again, we have the hot magma down here and we have a lot of elements in the rock and we have the cold seawater here. The seawater enters the rock, it gets heated by the magma like on a hot plate on your um, oven and all these elements enter the seawater and they come back out here. Now the water cools and everything falls out and forms deposits on the seafloor. Very simply speaking, you see just lots of letters moving around, and that's all that you need to take away from this. A lot of elements moving around, and this is why life can actually thrive at these mid-ocean ridges in several kilometers below the surface of the sea with zero light. It takes its energy from these black smokers. Now, 
going from there can actually all these impacts on Mars do the same thing? And you guess it. The answer is yes, they can. Because here you have a cross section of an impact crater. The rim is here, the other rim is there, and your hot plate is right here in the middle. And again, 120, 1200 degrees C, molten rock, and then cooling to the outside. In the next picture, I have the water on the right side and the elements moving around on the left. So here we go. You have the water which moves in from here. It starts to circulate in the rock. It comes out, it might form a lake. And on the right, you see that all these elements iron, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, carbon, which you know are important for life and supporting life, can get moved around by these hot systems and can be made available. So from that, we know Mars is a habitable planet. And I know I'm getting a little bit along here. I hope I have another minute to talk about another volatile, which is also important if we are looking for life on Mars, and that's methane. Methane has been discovered in the Martian atmosphere, but first of all, methane, that's, that's cows, right? If you talk about climate change, you talk about cows producing methane. I tell you, it's not the cows. It's the microbes in the cow's gut that produce the methane. There is no oxygen in a cow's gut. So there are anaerobic microbes which cause in the digestion process of this, these plants to form methane. So anaerobic microbes would be very happy on Mars because with all the CO2 in the atmosphere, there is barely any oxygen. So could that be a reason for the methane on Mars? And I'll tell you right here and then, we don't know. We haven't found any. We keep looking. Perseverance is going. ExoMars is going. Everyone keeps looking. We will have sample return in the 2028s or something. So we keep looking. We do not know yet. Now, what has been measured? Well, if this were a school talk, I'd say, can you just memorize this? There will be a test, but no. Let's look at two numbers here. 45 ppbb, parts per billion per volume. So in, in any given volume that there are a billion particles, there are 45 methane molecules. That's the highest number that was measured so far. Down here is the lowest number, three parts per billion per volume. So what is it? Right. The answer isn't very easy. These are the first 700 souls, Anna already said, a soul is a Martian day, of measurements of the SAM instrument on the Curiosity rover of methane. And well, here you go. There's almost nothing there most of the time. 0.7 parts per billion per volume. But sometimes we see these spikes, and the highest at that time was 7 parts per billion per volume. By now, we have found a spike of 21 parts per billion per volume. So that's the highest we have seen so far with the SAM instrument. Orbiters keep looking. We need to figure this out because there are spikes that occur suddenly and completely unpredictably currently. We don't understand exactly where they come from. Maybe when we know that there are air earthquakes, we can correlate this, but inside arrived later. So this is one of the open questions that we will keep investigating. Or and there is a seasonal change when methane moves from pole to pole and increases and decreases, and we understand that. So what's so important about methane? I mentioned the microbes. We don't know if they are there. How, could we, how can methane be formed if there are no microbes? Well, I told you, chassigny, all this olivine in the rock, it's actually a very common mineral on Mars, it, this olivine. And sometimes it occurs in its pure form, sometimes it's just in the basalt. And if this olivine meets the water, the water gives off a hydrogen in these reactions that happen between the water and the rock. And then you can form the methane with that hydrogen and the carbon from the CO2 of the Martian atmosphere. That can get stored, and that's why the earthquakes, or Marsquakes, I should say, are so important because they could release big bursts of that. Once it is in the atmosphere, it will be hit by UV irradiation and it will be destroyed and finally be carbon dioxide. However, we also have some surface organics which get hit by the UV. These come in and rain in from the solar system where they are not related to life 
we understand where they come from, but they get degraded to methane before that gets degraded to carbon dioxide. So there is another big chemical cycle going on where we have much yet to understand to say how much comes from the rock reaction, how much comes from the surface organics, when and how are getting these released. And only then we can say if there's a discrepancy that might or might not speak for life. But the ultimate proof would be to find some microbes in those returned samples. And I have a hunch that we will have to wait for there. So with that, just a little outlook. This is Mount Sharp in the background. This is the very stretched out Curiosity rover because it's a 360 degree panorama. This is, this is Namib Dune, an active aeolian process. And Curiosity is standing on lots of sedimentary rocks Sanjeev is going to talk about this, and I leave it at that because I've spoken way too long. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much indeed, Suzanne. Um, absolutely fascinating talk, showing us just what um, oh, what mysteries there still are on Mars to be discovered, and um, we're obviously ending with the topical question of, of methane and, and life. Um, we have some questions which have come in. We also have heard that the skies are clear over the UK and our observers are standing by with their telescopes. So um, we are going to go over them quite shortly. But um, before, first of all, would you be happy to do, answer some of the questions um, offline? I am um, very happy to do this. I have spoken way too long. And I think if the skies are clear, we go to the observers as well, quickly as possible. Uh, I, uh, I do have one question for you. This is absolutely fascinating. This is from Sophia, um, aged 10. And you talked about the volcano volcanism on yeah. Mars coming and going, unlike the other processes which stopped quite early on. Um, and Sophia asks, are any of the volcanoes on Mars likely to show activity in our lifetimes? <laughs> We don't know. This is why we have the orbiters. So we know that 160 million years is not very long. And maybe Anna can comment in the chat if she could distinguish moving magma in the underground from an earthquake that uh, stems from a fracture. I know they can do this on Earth. I don't know if they need more than one station for it. but. We don't know yet. That's one of the open questions and why we would love more than one seismometer on Mars. You can't really land on these volcanoes because you have to land in lower parts of Mars so that um, we can, that the spacecraft actually can land with a parachute. So some engineers, maybe you study engineering and you figure out how to land on these high volcanoes and then we will find out. We really don't know. Thank you very much for that, um, Suzanne, and also to Anna for your contribution this evening. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk showing just what research is going on on Mars and why we're still so fascinated by the Red Planet after all these millennia of observing it. And talking about observing, let's go out and see how it looks. I'm going to hand over now, at least I will stay here as a co-host, but I'm going to hand over to Callum Potter, who is Vice President of the British Astronomical Association and a member of the Cotswold Astronomical Society based in Gloucestershire. So could you tell us, Callum, what we're seeing up in the sky at the moment? <clears throat> oh, thanks very much, Nigel. Um, uh, well, in Gloucestershire, where I am, we're not seeing very much in the sky at the moment. It's, uh, it, um, it's been a, a bit of a strange day. Um, the skies have been clearing and going, uh, um, uh, Going clear, like some nice sunny spells, and then some cloudy, sp cloudy spells, and then some torrential rain. So it's certainly normal for for <laughs> weather in England, really. Yeah. Um, my background, that incidentally, is not how it looks outside at the moment. There isn't a comet out there in the sky, but uh, it's uh, as a reminder of what we saw during the summer months. Um, but we've got our team of astronomers uh, all ready to go um, for their uh, live uh, live broadcasts. Uh, from around the country. So we've got uh, Chris Hooker in uh, Oxfordshire, uh, that's in sort of central England. David Strange down at the Norman Lockyer Observatory down on the southwest coast of, uh, of England. And we've got Ian Laurie's in Essex, uh, the east coast of in the sort of south part of England as well. Uh, and we've also got John Dolan in Ireland. Uh, believe that it isn't very good either. Um, so we'll be talking to John later on, but uh, I don't think he's uh, able to do any live observing tonight. Um, but because we've got some uh, telescopes on Mars right now, 
I think we'll go straight over to Chris Hooker uh, and see what he's seeing through his telescope uh, right now. Chris. Okay, thanks, Callum. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm not sure about my image. I'm only lit by the uh, light of my... Um, <clears throat> so what I'll try and do, if I can, is <clears throat> share my screen and show you what I've got on the telescope at the moment should be that one. I hope everyone can see that. <clears throat> can you let me know if you can? Yes, I can see it very okay. clearly. I'm a bit wobbly. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, this is this is what we have tonight. This is Mars, obviously. Um, this is looking through an eight-inch Maksutov Cassegrain telescope. Um, which is on an equatorial mount. So it's actually tracking reasonably well. I'm not having to fiddle with it very much. I've been trying to get it better focused than this, but frankly, the seeing the atmospheric turbulence is so bad tonight that I simply can't improve on that, I don't think. Um, what you can see possibly is that the sort of lower left side of Mars is slightly darker than uh, the top part. Um, but frankly, that's about it. It's uh, shaking about, the air is very, very turbulent, and you can't really see any more detail, unfortunately. How typical is this kind of seeing? I mean, is this a, a really bad night, or is this average for your part of the um, This is, I think, worse than average, I would say. Um, it's, not, it's not good, obviously. Um, I've seen much better than this, and I've got some images that are much better than this. Um, but yeah, I think the problem is it's been very rainy all day and I think a cold front has gone through and that has basically um, caused a lot of cold air to come through and there's, there's turbulence, which is just causing mixing of different air layers. And that's why the image is shaking and shimmering and breaking up. So unfortunately, <laughs> because, because Mars is a relatively small planet and has a small angular size, um, you need to magnify it quite a lot in order to see a decent sized image. So I've got, uh, my telescope has a four meter focal length and I've got a times two Barlow lens in there. So I'm working with an eight meter focal length here. Mars is currently about 18 arc seconds in uh, angular diameter, which is really small. Not as small as some planets, but uh, still very small. And so even if the air was, if the air was perfectly steady, we'd see a much more detailed image than this. I can just occasionally catch glimpses of the South Polar Cap, which is on the, the sort of lower left here, but that should be much more obvious than it is. It's a very uh, disappointing view, frankly, but that's the conditions we have to deal with tonight. Do you have any images you've taken earlier or on previous nights that you can share? Um, yeah, I'll have to, I'm not sure how I change to what I'm sharing here. Let me just do this. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which, uh, so if you can see that, that is an image taken on the 14th of September. I'm still seeing the live feed. I'm not sure what everybody else is seeing, but that's what I've got. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're still, still, um, still on the live feed there. Um, right, okay. So Let's... Uh, let me just stop sharing for the moment and share PowerPoint presentation. Okay, can you see that now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we're just seeing. Yeah, I've got it now. Okay, so that was an image taken um, with the same telescope on the 14th of September. And the way these images are done is that you capture a video through the telescope, probably one or 2,000 frames. The cameras we use are designed specifically for this, so they can capture 30 or 40 or sometimes hundreds of frames a second. The one I'm using is, is quite an old one, so it only does 30 frames a second. But you capture a load of images, and even when the air is a bit turbulent, some of them will actually be quite good. And then you run the video through a piece of software which evaluates each image according to quality and how sharp it is. 
And whereas in the original video, the images are sorted in time order, the order in which you capture them, the software puts out a sequence which is ordered in terms of quality, starting with the best and finishing with the worst. And then you can decide at what point you want to stop using them. You, you throw away the bad ones, and then you stack the images electronically. The software does that, combines them all together. And what that does is eliminates the noise, which is present in all of the raw images. And when you've got a very low noise image, you can enhance it in something like Photoshop or in various other pieces of software. And that enables you to draw out the detail that you see in this image here without enhancing the noise. Because so, um, we've, uh, we've got some clear skies down in Devon at the moment, so I thought okay. we could maybe just quickly pop to David Strange and, sure. and see I'll what you're seeing, seeing, stop sharing seeing them. there. Can carry um, on. David, are you able to come online now? Ah, yes. Okay. Um, I will share my screen, which is linked to um, a little computer outside. Um, can you see that? Yes, that's okay. uh... so. Um, this is a different view of Mars. I'm a traditionalist, so I show um, south at the top <laughs> um, because I like to compare my uh, images with with uh, old Norman Lockyer's images that um, he drew 138 years ago. So um, yeah, so we've got the South Polar Cap up here. Um, Schiaparelli called this the Great Diaphragm on Mars, a big dark slash across, uh, across the area here. So you've got the sandy deserts um, to the north and the darker areas, which of course they thought were the seas back 138 years ago. So um, what I'm imaging through is a nine inch Celestron. Um, and if I just move you out of the way, um, it's only a very small part of the chip that we're using. If I go and show you, so we're imaging 320 by 240. The whole chip is five and a half thousand by three and a half thousand. So there's a little tiny image of how much area of the chip of the camera that we're actually using. So if we go back to 320 by 240, we can now enlarge it. So that just shows, and of course, the fact that we're using a very small area of the chip, we can get higher frame rates. Um, so I can't see what I'm using at the moment. It's probably over 100 um, frames per second. Um, so we're using EQ mod, so I can move Mars about the chip to get it central. And to capture an image, we just press capture 3000 frames and the software will run and it will capture an image. Uh, what you can also see here, unlike uh, Callum's, I'm actually imaging in uh, with a mono camera in red, green and blue filters. In fact, we're actually using an infrared pass filter, infrared 820 nanometers, uh, which is less susceptible to poor seeing than the, the shorter wavelengths. If I click the green button, we'll now change to a green filter. And you see that uh, lets more light through, so I have to turn down the gain. And you see it's not such a sharp image. Similarly, if we switch the blue, uh, the blue is quite dark, so we have to increase the exposure. Um, and that looks a bit out of focus to me, but the blue should show up the polar caps and we've seen some nice uh, blue fringes, uh, morning and evening clouds on Mars on clear images. So that's about all I can do on Mars at the moment. Um, I can show you a little bit uh, about the, the NLO, the observatory here, but I'm sure we've got other images people showing um, other objects if you want to switch to someone else. Thanks David. What, uh, what sort of telescope was that uh, again? Was that one of was that non telescope? This is Celestron 9. A Celestron 9, right, okay. Yeah. Um, so um, um, Chris and uh, David have been imaging Mars. 
Uh, Ian in the east side of the country has been uh, uh, imaging uh, our nearest neighbour galaxy, uh, Messi 31, uh, the great Andromeda galaxy. Uh, um, so uh, hopefully if we could go over to Ian now, uh, he'll be able to show us what he's been seeing from uh, Essex. Um, yeah, brilliant. Okay. Uh, I'm Ian Larrys from uh, North Essex Astronomical Society. Um, so I've been imaging Andromeda. Um, if we take a quick look at what we're actually seeing. Um, this is a live view of Andromeda. So I've been imaging for about 20 minutes now. I'm taking 30 second exposures through my telescope, um, which I'll tell you a bit about in a minute. Uh, and then similar to what we've done with Mars, um, but a bit more accurately, we are stacking those images. We're averaging them together to make a much better image. And the software is quite clever. What it actually does is it picks out all of the stars in the image in, e in each of the um, sort of, I think we're up to about 50 exposures in this image. Now, each of the 50 images we've taken, each of 30 seconds, it finds all the stars, matches them all up and aligns the image and then it averages them together to make this, this lovely view. Now, what we're looking at is uh, our, our nearest big neighbor. We have two small dwarf galaxy neighbors, the Magellanic Clouds, but they can only really be seen from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, they're, they're irregular ga galaxies. So they actually just look a bit like bits of the Milky Way that have been ripped off um, and moved across the sky. But Andromeda is a big spiral galaxy. We used to think it was much bigger than uh, our own galaxy, but actually recently we've discovered they're probably about the same size. Uh, Andromeda is about two, uh, two and a half million light years away. Uh, so what that actually means is that the light that we're seeing tonight left the stars in Andromeda when our ancestors were sort of um, ape-like creatures that had just come down from the trees and were starting to up, walk upright on the plains. So what we're seeing here tonight is two, two, two and a half million years ago. Um, what you can actually see is the bright core of the galaxy. This is where all the old stars are. It's a bit like uh, if you imagine two fried eggs uh, stuck back to back and then tipped over on its side. This core is like a big bulge where the yolks are. And then we have the spiral arms on each side, um, which are like sort of the whites of the egg stretched out. Um, and what you can actually see is these dark lines here are dust. And, and there's a lot of dust in galaxies that uh, the rocky planets and, and the cores of the bigger planets form from. And then there's a lot of gas as well. And all the stars are, are spinning around and around to make these big spiral arms. You can also see two other galaxies here. Uh, these are two dwarf galaxies that are actually orbiting around the center of Andromeda. They're a bit like planets going around the sun, but they're galaxies that are actually orbiting around the bigger galaxy. Um, so if you, um, maybe if we zoom in a little bit, I'll, uh, I'll zoom in um, to 100% and we can see much more closely now. You can see uh, these, um, these dust lanes here and the stars in between them. Most of the stars you can see in this image are in our own galaxy. They're much, much nearer to us than, than the stars in Andromeda. Most of the stars in Andromeda are too far away to be seen uh, as individual stars. They're just seen as this glow of light. But there are some super giants, uh, blue giants, hypergiant stars, and so it patches here, for example. Um, there are uh, individual stars that we can actually see across this vast distance. Uh, and there's another patch on down the other end here. Um, so this patch here is, again, some of these are super uh, giant blue stars. They're really hot. They will only live for a couple of million years, whereas our own sun will live for about 10 billion years. Uh, if we take a look at um, what we're actually looking at here. Um, so this is the setup I'm using. Um, this here is my little um, back garden observatory that I built with um, zero woodworking skills. I'm, I'm more of a computer guy than a practical guy, but I uh, had a bit of time on my hands and, and, and put it together. It's what we call a roll off roof observatory. It's much easier to build than a dome. And really the roof is just on wheels that we can slide off. Inside, we have um, two telescopes. This is much smaller than the telescopes that the other guys have been showing you. Uh, this is an 81 millimeter refractor. So it's got a, uh, three lenses actually at the front here. It's quite a good one. It's a triplet. Um, this is a, a guide scope. This is also, this is an 80 millimeter refractor. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a much cheaper telescope. It doesn't need to be very good. What happens is we take the image using this camera at the bottom here um, and a filter wheel. So we've got the red, green, blue 
and, and clear filters in the filter wheel. We can spin those around to take different colored images. With this camera here, it has a chip that's a bit similar to what you'd have in your DSLR camera, except it's monochrome. But the key point is that it has a cooler in there that cools the chip down to about minus 15 uh, degrees Celsius that actually makes the image much less noisy. Uh, and on the guiding scope, we have a much smaller, cheaper camera. And its job is just to capture an image of the sky and to track a particular star uh, that we've locked onto. The, the mount here can track reasonably accurately, but it does tend to wave around quite a lot, uh, you know, a few uh, fractions of a degree, which would make the image very blurry. So this camera's job is just to track the star and correct its tracking every few seconds to make sure it stays on, on track. Um, if we then take a look, this is again taken through the same telescope, the same setup. But what I've done here is I've taken a low, about three hours worth of images through different colored filters, through red, green and blue and a clear filter. And now you can see it in all its glory. You can see in the middle here we have very orange colors. This is because most of the stars in the middle are very old and getting near the end of their life. And they tend to get uh, bigger and redder. And there are some very young stars out here that are hot and blue um, and the dust traveling around the middle here. As I say, all of these other stars that you can see in the image pretty much are in our own galaxy. Um, but some of the stars in these little patches here are um, in, in Andromeda. They are so bright that we can see them all that distance away. Um, and the two bright galaxies, bright blobs near the galaxy, they're, they're companion galaxies, aren't they? Yes, they are dwarf galaxies that are orbiting um, around. So they're literally that there's a there's a lot of mass in the, in the star. There's also even more mass that we can't see in dark matter. We don't really know where it is, but we know it's there because if it wasn't there, uh, this galaxy is spinning so fast that actually all these stars would fly off into space, and the dwarf galaxies would fly off into space. There isn't enough stuff that we can see uh, to keep the galaxy together. So we know there's something else here that's much more massive than the actual stars and dust and gas that we can actually see. Uh, called dark matter, and that's actually holding the galaxy together. Uh, we would dearly love to know what it is, but uh, it doesn't really interact with anything, so we can't figure out what it is at the moment. Hopefully in our uh, lifetime we will find out though. It's a very impressive um, image, Ian. I love that one. Um, could you tell us, for those who are not familiar with telescopes, how that would look if you actually put your eye to the eyepiece of a telescope? Would it be anything like that? Okay, so if you put your eye to the eyepiece of a reasonably large telescope, maybe a 10 inch telescope, so if you look at a small telescope, you will see Andromeda. It's actually that you can actually see it with the naked eye if you know where to look. Um, it's pretty much the furthest thing away you can see with your naked eye. If you've got a nice dark sky and you look up, you'll see a little misty patch if you look in exactly the right spot. Um, it's about this whole galaxy is about three times the size of the full moon. So you put the full moon here here and here. So it's quite big on the sky. If you look through a telescope, generally you'll just see the bright core. And if you've got a big enough telescope, maybe 10 inch, 8 inch, you can just about to start to see these dark dust lanes. The biggest problem with Andromeda, even with a really big telescope in a dark sky, is it's so big that you can't fit it all in one uh, field of view in any, any reasonable eyepiece. Um, you generally can only see the middle part. But the darker the skies, the more you'll see. But you can definitely see it through a small pair of binoculars. You know where to look, get your planetarium app out, look it up, have a look through the binoculars. You will definitely see this little misty patch. And as you, as you get, uh, if you're younger, more chance of seeing it really well because your eyes work better than when we're, we're uh, as old guys where our eyes are, uh, are pretty uh, poorly performing. And then in some ways, it's a good uh, analog for our own galaxy. So if we were on Andromeda, looking back at our galaxy, our galaxy might look a bit like this as well. Uh, yeah, it might actually look a bit more like, uh, this is um, M33, which is our, our other neighbor galaxy. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit smaller than the Milky Way and Andromeda, but it's the third of the sort of group of nearby big galaxies. Um, uh, it, it, it's probably a bit, our galaxy is probably a little bit looser in terms of spiral arms. And it's also what they call a barbed uh, spiral. So there's a, a big line running across the middle uh, of it, we believe. Very hard to know because we can't get outside our galaxy to look at it. So we can only sort of estimate what it looks like, but we think it will probably look a bit more like this, but with a big bar running across the middle. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly very similar um, in, 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 in sort of size and view to, uh, to what, we, what we see of Andromeda. So they could be looking back at us right now, seeing these little monkey creatures that have literally just come out of the trees and they've got a big enough telescope. Thanks, 
I could just go back to the live view briefly. Um, so how long are the individual exposures that you're taking there with the, with the live view? 30 second exposures at the moment. Um, yeah, I could, I could go I could go shorter than that, but um, 30 seconds is pretty good with the telescope. Uh, and as I say, we're now up to um, 71 30 second exposures that we've, we've stacked up uh, an average. And the longer we go, the better the image gets. I mean, basically what happens is the noise, the speckly stuff you get in the background, particularly the sky, the longer you go, uh, actually gets worse, but the bright stuff, the stars and the things we're interested in gets much better, much quicker than the noise does. So the longer we go uh, taking an image, um, the more detail comes out, the more detail becomes visible. And some things like this, you can get a really nice image like I've just shown you in you know, maybe two, three hours with a small telescope. Other things, um, sort of more fainter nebula that I tend to image, and we do them in different wavelengths where there's much less light. Uh, you, you could be looking at, I think one of my favorite things I've done recently, uh, it literally took me about, um, I think it was about 28 hours of exposures over the course of, of, of a month and a half. Um, in, and that was in four panes, so quite a lot of, of effort. And that's a real challenge in this country because, as we all know, it rains at the drop of a hat. You know, the, the, one of our friends in North Essex Astro has recently moved to Spain, and we have regular Zoom meetings to, to talk to him about things. And the, really, we, we're thinking of cancelling them because he just keeps telling us how clear the skies are every time we, every time he comes on. But uh, yeah, you need you need you need some luck. But uh, I usually get two or three good images a year uh, if the weather cooperates. But uh, it, it can take a bit of time. Let's go over to uh, J, uh, John in Ireland now uh, and find out what the skies are like uh, where he is. John. Uh, hiya, Colin and, and everybody. <clears throat> yeah, the skies are uh, pretty bad here. Uh, there's an odd gap comes, but I must. it was 80 or 90% cloud and it's going to get worse over the night. But uh, so I'm afraid we're, we're not set up, uh, you know, uh, uh, the telescopes are there, but there's no point in uh, showing you them because of the, the skies as they are. Um, I, I do have a, uh, a PowerPoint here. I can show you uh, where the telescope uh, is. Uh, there's a lot on the slide about, uh, you know, let me just get this on share screen. And uh, now, there we go. Uh, there's a lot on the club here, but I, I'll, I'll just go straight down to uh, a picture of the telescopes that we had set up for tonight. Uh, there we go. Uh, that's uh, two refractors on the on the on the left hand side, mounted in uh, the observatory, and. Uh, the, there's a computer at the base there of the, of the observatory, you see. There's a, uh, the two refractors. The one, the black one is a uh, Equinox 120, and it's set up with a, a Starlight Express uh, uh, camera. And uh, you see the filter wheel there in front of it. And there's an off-axis guider in, in that one. And uh, on the other, it's also, it's piggybacked on top of... Uh, a Skywatcher Equinox uh, with a Canon camera, your normal uh, everyday Canon camera that uh, people can attach to the back of the telescopes to make a, a quite simple uh, rig. But um, so that's the setup. And you see there's a Celest uh, Celestron C11 on the right hand side. And uh, we have it set up there in the open. I normally don't do planetary work as many deep sky. And um, so uh, this is what we would have with an imaging source uh, camera fixed to it. But um, so that's the telescope. That's, that's the Celestron telescope we use at our various uh, uh, public star parties around the city. So, so for, for people who are not really familiar with astronomy, John, what, what do you mean by deep sky? So deep sky is where outside the solar system, essentially. Um, so, uh, you know, so it can, you'd be talking about uh, millions of light years away and uh, 
much closer to say a hundred light years away. So that the range is uh, considerable, uh, the classification of deep sky. But essentially it's anything outside the solar system. So, uh, so that's it, Colin. Um, so it's a pity that uh, we couldn't show you. I had um, set up for clear days uh, tonight and um, but unfortunately we can't see it. And we would have went to M31 as well. Uh, that was a fine image of um, earlier we saw. Uh, and, and see if we can go back to, to Chris and see if he's still got Mars on view through his telescope. Okay. How, how are things with you, Chris? Can everybody see that? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's... I've got some thin cloud now, so what I've had to do is increase the exposure time, which is why it's apparently not moving quite as much, but it's also more fuzzy. So I'm frankly, I'm not really sure it's worth doing this. I can't see anything worth seeing right now. I think one of the interesting things, Chris, is actually looking at the colour. We talk about Mars as being the red planet, and some of the pictures returned by space missions to Mars, um, obviously, the colours there are, are, are adjusted anyway, they have to be because they're taken through filters um, and sometimes the balance makes them look look very red. Um, but the colour you've got up there shows how Mars really does look if you apply your eye to the eyepiece of a telescope. It's more of a rusty ochre kind of colour. It is. It's, it's very difficult to know how to set the colours when you're taking an image of Mars because um, I have to admit I'm slightly red-green colourblind so I don't <laughs> know how other people see it anyway um and i i do it i set it the way i think it should be but i see other people's images on the ba web pages and i think oh, that's a bit pink or that's not quite red enough or something so <laughs> that's, it's, that's, 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 that's the color, it's color that i see it so we can both agree on this one so, well okay we, we agree on that that's fine <laughs> um but yeah i think i've got uh, I'm on the edge of some cloud that's rolling in. I'm going to say this is now double the exposure I was using before, and the image is still fainter. So it's uh, it's probably not worth. Uh, doing it. And it's also getting very windy, and as you windy, windy as well. Thinking about so, um, I think we might as well call a halt on that, and I'll uh, I'll give way to someone else. Okay. Um, right. So we uh, we've been. Maybe give you an idea of where things are in the sky. So if you go outside any evening over the next month or so, if you look south, um, so if you figure out where the sun set and keep that on your um, right hand side, you're looking pretty much south. You'll see Mars uh, quite um, high up in the sky. It's very, very bright red and on its own, it's very hard to, to mistake it for anything else. It really is very red. That's where Mars is. Uh, and then we were looking at Andromeda, that's a, quite a bit higher up and slightly to the left. And now we're going to look at M33, which is the other companion galaxy that we talked about. Uh, so if I switch over to the live view, uh, we now have um, a capture of M33. As I say, this is the, the sort of the, 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 li the little um, sibling of, of M31 uh, Andromeda and Milky Way galaxy. It is the third big galaxy in our in our local group, but it is uh, much smaller. It's much easier to see the spiral arms because we're looking down on it a bit more from above. The, the central core is not quite so pronounced and bulgy, um, and the, the arms are a bit more irregular. They're a bit they're a bit more sort of broken up. Now, in uh, in in full color, if I switch over to uh, back over to PowerPoint, um, what you can see is that uh, the, the, the color is, it's a bit, this is not a great color, this isn't from an old, older camera, I put, took this with a Canon 500, the DS, DLSR R camera doesn't perform quite as well, uh, but you can kind of see it's a bit more purplish, and in the better camera you see there are lots of red blobs all the way around these arms, and these are blobs of hydrogen gas where stars form. Now those, those blobs are uh, quite obvious, when you're looking from outside, but they're quite hard to see in our own galaxy because there's lots of other stuff in the way. Uh, a bit later on in the winter when Orion is higher in the sky earlier in the night, you can look for the famous Orion Nebula. Uh, that again is something you can see with the naked eye or you can look through uh, a telescope. And that is one of these hydrogen regions where stars are forming. It looks like a little fuzzy cloud through 
uh, through a pair of binoculars or through a small telescope. And it looks quite gray green to our eyes because our eyes aren't sensitive to color in the dark. But if you take a photograph of it, uh, you get you get quite a, a pronounced red color. And so that that's M33. That is uh, to say that's our third um, nearest neighbor. Um, it is very much, uh, uh, say, um, close to, close to us. Most of the other galaxies that we look at are quite a bit further away, so they will appear much smaller in, 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 the, in the telescope, uh, but nonetheless quite interesting. But these, these three, um, Milky Way, Andromeda and M33, are the, the interesting ones. We can see uh, M31 uh, with the naked eye. M33 is a bit harder to see through a telescope and binoculars. It's quite faint. It, it is actually relatively bright, but it's quite large and diffuse. Uh, so it doesn't actually appear so bright to the, to the eye. You really need a camera to bring it out. And whenever I'm hunting through it through, visually through a telescope, it usually takes me about 10 minutes to figure out whether I'm actually looking at it or not. Um, and normally the way I can tell is if I move the telescope to off the target, off to the, a dark bit of the sky and then move it back, I can see it getting brighter. Then after about 10 more minutes of staring, I finally convince myself that I've got it in the field of view, unlike Andromeda, which is really, really obvious when you see it because of that really bright core, it, it, it's much easier to spot. Um, so that's our, that, as I say, that's uh, our, um, our nearest neighbor galaxy, uh, second nearest neighbor galaxy. Um, again, you know, the, these galaxies are all, all different. The three in our area are spiral galaxies, so they, they've all got spiral arms. As galaxies tend to grow, and they grow by cannibalism. They tend to eat other galaxies and merge together. They will tend to turn into elliptical galaxies, which are a bit more boring to look at. They're sort of just more like a big blob or a big egg without any spiral arms. And what's going to happen in a couple of billion years is Andromeda uh, is going to be coming our way. So um, Andromeda, as we looked at, it looks quite big in the sky now. If you come back in you know, a billion and a half, years or so, it's going to look really big in the sky because it's coming straight at us in, in the front window and we're going to crash into it. And uh, actually what will happen is the two galaxies will pass right through each other and uh, they will move apart again and then gravity will pull them back together a couple more times. Then they'll probably merge into more, more than likely a large elliptical galaxy. Now during that cataclysmic um, crash between the two galaxies, uh, absolutely no chance of any stars getting destroyed or very, very little chance of any stars getting destroyed. Even though there are billions of stars coming and passing through each other, there's so much space between the stars and galaxies. They'll, they're like ghosts. They will just pass through each other and, and almost no chance of two stars actually colliding in that process. And when they merge, uh, you'll end up with this big elliptical galaxy. Uh, which would be a lot less interesting to look at, but nothing for us to worry about two and a half billion years in the future. Just a reminder, if anyone's got any um, questions, um, please just type them in the Q&A or on the, uh, the chat on YouTube, and we'll, uh, we'll try and do our best to, to, to answer them uh, as best we can. We are all uh, amateur astronomers here, really, um, so we're not necessarily uh, able to answer uh, deep, meaningful questions on astrophysics, but... Uh, um, and, and the, the origins and fate of the universe, but uh, we'll do our best to answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, we'd quite like to go back to David now uh, for a little while and tell us a little bit about the, the, um, the Norman Lockyer Observatory, which uh, David is, uh, is, is working at uh, in uh, Sidmouth in uh, Devon, uh, which is quite a historic uh, observatory uh, and uh, has been making observations of Mars for uh, for, for many, uh, many decades uh, or century even. Okay, can you all see that? Yep, that's great, David. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm chairman here at the Norman Lockyer Observatory um, down here on the coast at Sidmouth. A wonderful setup, it's really quite unique. And we've got to thank uh, Norman Lockyer for setting us up back in 1912. It was established as what it was then called the Hill Observatory on the top of Salkham Hill. And it was renamed the NLO, the Norman Lockyer Observatory, um, after his death in 1920, uh, when it was run by his son, Jim Lockyer. And it was privately run until the 1960s by the Norman Lockyer Corporation, uh, when it was taken over by Exeter University. For those who don't know, uh, Lockyer made very 
Well, he started by making very important observations of Mars. There were a lot of features on Mars um, that actually bears his name. He discovered helium in the sun in 1868, um, also regarded as the father of, of astroarchaeology and the founding editor of the journal Nature. So this was his wonderful telescope, um, a six and a quarter inch cook that Lockyer used to discover the element helium on the sun in 1868. He also used these, this telescope for observations of Mars in 1862. And in those days, um, he didn't actually have a lovely brass tube for it. He made a paper mache tube. So it was remarkable the quality of the lens. It's a Cook refractor that he made these drawings and he was quite an excellent draftsman. Here's some drawings he made in September uh, 1862. He had a very similar um, opposition of Mars uh, that year. It came to opposition in, in October, so very similar set up to, uh, to what we have this year. Uh, and he sent his drawings to Professor Phillips at Oxford, who remarked, these drawings are some of the best I have seen. And here we can see the famous arm of Mars, the Sinus Meridiani, Dawes, Forked Bay, and Aurora Sinus here. Now I thought it'd be fun to uh, use my telescope at the same uh, central meridian longitude, 330 degrees, almost exactly 158 years, almost the day uh, that Lockyer made his drawing. This is of course with his six and a quarter inch refractor. And this is with my, the nine inch telescope we've just been imaging. And you can see, it was remarkable what they could see back in 1862. We've got here the Certis Major, Here's the, the sinus at Meridiani. Um, and this bright patch here, we now know, of course, it's called Hellas. It was named Hellas by Schiaparelli. But in those days, Lockyer was named after Lockyer. It was called Lockyer Land. In those days, they saw the dark areas were the seas and the white patches uh, were the land. And uh, one of the uh, things they had to, the earliest maps they had of Mars were Beer and Madler's map. And then Nathaniel Green, who was one of the founder members of the BAA, uh, drew up um, this map. He also taught Queen Victoria how to paint. So he's quite a draftsman. And this is Patrick Moore's, uh, uh, from Patrick Moore's book on Mars showing the wonderful names that was used. This, of course, before Schiaparelli um, made all the, uh, changed all the, the nomenclature. But you can see all of uh, Green's pals. We've got Lockyer. We've got Moraldi C here. This, he was the, uh, the nephew of Cassini. We've got Delarue, famous astronomer at the time. We've got Dawes Bay. Kaiser C, he was a German astronomer. So all these features were named after the astronomers um, of the day. And Nathaniel Green remarks on Mars, it's a beautiful Fabergé egg of a planet, a salmon disc streaked here and there with patches of simonum brown. So wonderful flowery descriptions um, of Mars, because all that changed when Schiaparelli, who was more a classicist, uh, created lots of new features. He saw more structure, he saw, saw these canali, and he re renamed a lot of these features, uh, which have stood the test of time and, of course, what we use today. So that's a bit of historic um, of Mars observing. Uh, of course, another fine telescope we have here in the NLO is the Kensington Refractor, built in 1884. Uh, it's a 10-inch refractor. If I play this little video, you'll see over swinging over to the left now, we see this gantry. This is the power supply that drives this telescope's clock drive. It's 100 kilos of lead weights supported by a cable. If we now go in through the door, 
we can follow the cable under the floor and then as we go inside it runs up the side of the tube there's Lockyer standing in front of the telescope and it's a power supply to our clock drive uh, the governor's there uh, governing the speed it's rotating and there's a rod driving uh, what's called a worm and a wheel that's moving this telescope at ideal real rate. So it's now tracking the stars. Big counterweights on this side of the axis. It's of course a polar <coughs> axis. This is the main tube. And this is the prismatic camera. At the top of this tube was a big prism over here, which uh, collected light uh, and exposed the spectrum of the stars onto a glass plate where they would have had to um, uh, develop the next day. So a little introduction to the NLO. We'll pop over, and over to, to Robin's uh, schedule next, uh, who's got um, some uh, hints on finding Mars with the naked eye. Um, yep. Are you uh, able to go, Robin? Yes, yes, I am. And I'm just going to share my screen now. I, <clears throat> we, it is clear. I just had a look outside. It's clear here in uh, Buckinghamshire in the London area. And... Um, a few minutes ago, I recorded a video with my camera. I'll show you the camera that I use. This is it. It's a Sony A7S camera, and it has fantastic video capabilities. It can record up to, uh, well, actually, I use it at its uh, one of its lower speeds of 80,000 ISO. If you're familiar with, um, with cameras, you'll know that's pretty high. And um, I hope this uh, screen share works. I'm going to show the... Um, uh, the video I did just a few minutes ago. Okay, so we can see Mars and we can hear sounds. Yeah, that's yeah, the video. That's it. Well, there you are. There's Mars right in the middle of the field of view. Um, over there is the constellation of Aries, and above it you'll find the uh, the constellation of uh, Pegasus. I've increased the magnification now, and you can just about see the stars of Pisces there. And it, this is a, on a loop, so it's, it's running again. And uh, you can't miss its very orange colour. So I know we had questions about how, do, how can you see Mars? Where do you look for it? Just go outside and look. And that was one taken just literally a few minutes ago. And you can see that it is really a very prominent bright red colour in the, in the sky. Um, so the message is go out and look. And if you won't see as many stars as this. Just there is a little pattern known as the circuit of stars. The square of Pegasus is right above it, and you just see one of the stars there. Uh, but So this is to encourage people to go out and look at Mars. If you've got binoculars, then take a look and you can see the colour. But if you look earlier in the evening, you can also see the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, I'm, I won't risk sharing my screen. I did a, a video a while back of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn as well. But go out and see it for yourself because it won't be as bright as this for a, a good few years yet. It will be around in a couple of years time again, but not quite as bright as it is now. And so this is why we're doing National Astronomy Week at this time, because Mars is a fantastic planet to go and look at. So that's all I've got and I'll stop share now and I think we can move on to somebody else. Thanks very much, Robin. Uh, yes, we're going to go uh, back to, to Essex and Ian, uh, who's looking at um, the uh, Pleiades uh, star cluster. Yeah, uh, okay, so again, just to give you an idea of where we are in the sky, uh, it's Pleiades is coming up in the east now, so if you go out and find Mars and look round to your left, you'll be able to see uh, the Pleiades coming up, otherwise known as the Seven Sisters. Uh, so what that actually looks like through uh, the telescope um, is this. It, it's a very, uh, it's a, a star cluster. So all these bright stars that you can see here are all related. They're all born in the same cloud of gas and dust. Uh, they're a few million years old and they're on their way uh, to sort of um, young adulthood. They're starting to drift away from their family as they go around the Milky Way. They orbit around the galaxy. They're starting to move apart but they're all still quite close together at the moment. Uh, it's very easy to see with the naked eye and looks lovely in a, in a pair of binoculars. Uh, it's, a, it's a little cloudy patch. And if you're young and you've got good eyesight, you'll probably be able to see more than seven stars. When you get to my age, you're sort of questioning whether you can see it at all, but uh, it, it's a good eye test. 
Uh, it looks a bit weird in the live view here because all these spiky bits coming out here are actually being caused by, it, it's a bit low down from where my observatory is. So I think there's a tree or possibly the neighbor's TV area in the way. And that kind of makes the light go into what we call these diffraction spikes. Uh, so you get these, these lines, but, but nonetheless, it looks lovely. Um, what you can see here, you see this sort of um, patch here. This isn't dirt on my lens or dirt in my camera. This is actually dust that's been left over from when the, all of these stars formed. There originally would have been a big cloud of gas, hydrogen gas mainly and some helium, and dust that, that had come from earlier, older stars. Altogether, once the stars form and they start getting really, really hot, they heat up all of the gas and dust because the gas is quite um, light. It tends to heat up and blow away into space. The dust is much heavier, so it hangs around for much longer. Uh, so what you can see, these streaks, this isn't dirt to say this. Well, it is dirt, quite literally, but it's not dirt on my camera. It's dirt in space. If I switch over to a picture that I took uh, a, a, a few years ago. Again, <coughs> the same sort of setup. You can see it much more clearly here. We've got bright stars. They're all young. They're all hot. And they're very, very blue. Um, probably not as blue as this naked eye. I've kind of exaggerated the blue here. But you can see all of these streaks of dust. They're just being illuminated by the hot young stars. It's just light reflecting off the dust. We can see it all here. Now, um, it's called N45 after a guy called Charles Messier, who was very interested in finding comets and kept finding other things. So he made the, what they call the uh, Messier catalogue. Uh, it's, it's a hundred and something objects that look a bit like comets that he noted down uh, when he was searching for New France. Uh, and uh, he made a big list of stuff that wasn't a comet. And now we use it to find things that are interesting to look at. Um, so it's called M45. It's also called the Pleiades. Uh, it's also called um, in Japan by another name. Now, if you come from Essex, I don't come from Essex personally, but I live in Essex. Uh, so we always have this chat when we're doing public outreach. They love their cars in, in Essex, especially ones with big exhaust pipes. They say, do you recognize this symbol? And of course, it's uh, called Subaru in Japan. So if you find a, a nice Subaru, one of those sporty cars with a big exhaust pipe, roaring down the street, making all that noise. And look at the badge on the front. You'll see this, uh, this symbol, uh, which is Subaru. That's the Japanese name for the flyer of these. Again, if we go back to the uh, live view, as I say, again, it, it can be a bit tricky to bring the details out. I'm using much shorter exposures this time because the stars are so bright. So I'm exposing for six seconds and I've uh, stacked together about 93 images here. The dust is just starting to come out now. Uh, if I went on for, for an hour or two again, I'd have another lovely image. And again, this is in black and white because the camera is monochrome. And what I would do is I would use different colored filters. And I'll take a bunch of exposures through a red, a green and a blue filter. And then we join them all together to make, make the main image. The reason you don't have to do that with your phone camera or with your DSLR is that actually they are black and white cameras, but all of the pixels have different filters on them. So you have some with red some with green and some with blue actually built into the camera. And we take all the different colors together. But each pixel, each little element in the image only has one of the colors and you get the missing colors from that pixel by comparing it to the surrounding other pixels. If you've got a blue pixel, you look at the red and the green ones all the way around and you average them together to put the missing colors back in. Um, we don't do that in, uh, in a lot of deep sky imaging. Well, lots of people do, but I don't because it allows us to actually get images much quicker. And it also allows us to uh, put other types of filter on that bring out certain details uh, in certain nebulae. But uh, it, it, as I say, it's quite convenient as well for doing this live viewing, because by having a clear filter on, we get much more light to the image built up much more quickly. So uh, that's M45, that's the fly of these. And, and there's lots of software um, free and paid for out there to, to do this sort of stuff, Ian, isn't there? Which, which software do you use for the, the live stacking here? I'm using SharpCap, so that is it's a program called SharpCap. That's called, um, it's free. Uh, there's, it's got some features. You can pay £10 a year to get some extra features. It's quite handy if you're sort of more into this kind of stuff. But it's a free piece of software. I've seen some of the other guys are using Fire Capture. Again, same sort of software. Again, it's free. Um, there are other bits of software that I'm using. Uh, I don't know if I can bring this up. So here um, you can see the unsung heroes of uh, astrophotography. This is my guide camera. Remember I had that second telescope. And what it's doing is it's taking an image every three seconds and working out whether this star has moved or not. 
and the lines you can see down here is it's correcting the movement of the telescope in the two directions it can go in to keep it centered. Now we take thousands and thousands of these images every night and we throw them all away so they're the uh, unsung heroes of astrophotography. And the other bit of software I use is a thing called Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, this is really clever. It actually links all of the different bits of kit I've got together. And I can literally program into this during the day what I want to take a picture of, how many pictures I want to take. And I just open up the observatory, set it going and go to bed. And I get up the next morning, close the observatory, done all the hard work, found the object, it changes the filters, keeps the telescope pointed. Uh, it focuses every so often because the focus needs to be changed. A little motor on my focuser. I, it's, it's been a real boon. I used to have to stay up all night to do imaging and uh, work, you know, working for a living. That's not very easy. Now I can literally just fire the thing up before I go to bed, uh, have a good night's sleep, and get up in the morning. Provided it's not likely to rain, because the only thing I haven't got automated is opening and closing the observatory. Uh, so yeah, if, if you like computers, this is definitely the game for you. Uh, but you can start off really simply with a telescope. You don't need lots and lots of fancy software. If you've got a small telescope, you can point it at the moon and get your phone camera um, and just hold it up to the eyepiece. Just hold the little camera on the back up to the eyepiece and you can take pictures of the things like the moon really, really easily. And it's surprising how addictive it is. So uh, you know, yes, we use lots of expensive kit once we get seriously into this game, but actually starting out, you, you don't need very much at all. Uh, it, as, as we said earlier, the cost of this equipment has come down rapidly over the years and really what we're using now probably would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds you know back in the sort of 1970s or 1980s to achieve the same level of what we're doing now for you know a few thousand or a few hundred pounds. Well thanks uh, very much Ian I think we're uh, just about at our, uh, our end of time for this evening um, I'd just like to thank everyone that's uh, is, uh, contributed tonight with their uh, live observing and, uh, and and not so live observing. Um, and uh, Nigel, are you still around? I'm still here, yes. I hope you can see me. And yes. um, thank you for that, Callum. And thank you very much for coordinating all the observers. And thank you for showing us what you can see or hope to see and a bit of background about your own observatories and um, where you are. Uh, so I've been here for the last two hours. It's been a fascinating evening, seeing Mars, hearing our two speakers earlier on, and I'm very grateful to everybody. And I hope everyone has enjoyed our discussions of Mars. Of course, this is an ongoing series. This is only the second night of eight. And um, tomorrow, I think we're building up to something even more fascinating. And that is the story of life on Mars. Or is there life on Mars? Isn't there? What are the clues? So um, please join us during the day at um, 11 o'clock in the morning. We're starting with activities from the Hurstman Sioux Science Centre, where the old Royal Observatory used to be down in Sussex. And then, of course, we have our evening session starting at six o'clock and then the observing session at seven o'clock. And we keep our fingers crossed for better skies tomorrow. So thank you all again. Can everybody who's been involved tonight please turn the cameras on and so we can all wave and say thank you very much and hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye. Bye all. Bye. Thank you.